I challenged myself to build a custom table with no square edges because, well, squares are just boring. I tried some new techniques I was pretty afraid to try, but in the end, I was able to ship my client a pretty sweet table, not without some drama though. For this project, I was really looking to do something a little bit different. My client reached out to me and basically said, hey, looking for a wanna end table, design something cool and build it for me. As any custom furniture maker knows, those are about the best words you can possibly hear. I knew this was my chance to design a one of a kind piece. So instead of starting with a blank canvas for the design, I tried to look at the slab and figured maybe it would give me some inspiration for the design. The longer I looked at it, the more I realized it was trying to tell me something. And then it whispered, bean. I was like, bean? And then I was like, oh, bean, okay. So as any normal person does when a piece of wood starts talking to you, I printed out a giant kidney bean that I was going to reference for this tabletop. I'm using a slab of clarowana that has some amazing burl figure. And like I said in the beginning, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I think a kidney bean shaped walnut tabletop is about as different as you can get. The only question is, is will I be able to pull it off or will it look ridiculous? But that was a risk I was willing to take and I wanted to find that out. So once I knew the shape of the top, I could work on a design for the base to go along with this weird shape. This was actually a little bit difficult to find an aesthetic kind of design that looked good with the kidney bean shape. Eventually though, I was happy with this design that I had here. I had these oval shaped legs with an oval cut through the middle and I thought it was cool, but it was still missing something. Then I added this gold section on the inside of the ovals and I was sold. I was like, yep, that's it right there. So I sent the drafts over to my client and he said, looks awesome. I love it. So it's hard to argue with that. And I got started. So that leads us to where we are now. I have my template cut out and sanded to the shape that I'm going for. So I decided to just stick that whole thing on there with double sided tape. And I really wanted to make sure that thing wasn't going anywhere and was stuck on there. Now this slab is almost three inches thick, which is pretty dang thick, but I decided to try and use a jigsaw to rough cut the edges. Now I didn't get very far until I kind of had to change my plan. So my last jigsaw blade just snapped and I don't have another one. I don't really feel like going to get any more. So I'm just gonna brute fork this thing through the bandsaw. <laughs> Probably not the safest way to do it, but we're gonna try and just see what happens. So let's go ahead and do that. So the reason I didn't just shove this slab through my bandsaw to begin with is because this thing's pretty heavy and it's a kind of awkward, weird shape too. But sometimes you just gotta send it and do some stupid stuff because that's what keeps life interesting. At least that's what I keep telling myself and that'll probably catch up to me here someday sooner or later. But until then, I plan on continuing to do stupid things, so I'm just gonna keep doing that. Anyways, once I got that big chunk cut off, it was much easier to manage, and I made pretty easy work of the rest of it. I lived a lot of my woodworking career without a small palm router, and once I finally got one, I realized how much of a mistake that was. This little router made it so much easier to template route this slab, I used to have to get my big chunky router out and lug that thing around the top of the table, but now I can route with ease. So if you haven't picked up a palm router yet, I definitely recommend it. Although if I could do it differently, I would probably get a battery powered one so it can be even more convenient. Maybe someday it'll be so convenient that it'll do the routing for you. But I guess until then, I'll get out my big chunky router and finish the flush trimming out myself. Now routing is always extra fun because it makes this brown confetti like you're having a little routing party. I mean, it doesn't get much better than having brown sawdust all over every part of every inch of your clothes, especially when you have to clean it up all by yourself when you're done.
So like I said earlier in the video, this slab is a clear walnut burl slab that I had shipped in from California all the way over to Pennsylvania where I work because sadly, we really don't get too much lumber or wood that has this crazy grain structure and wild colors throughout the wood. Now I'm not sure if this is true or not, so don't quote me on this, but I've heard this is because the water and the rivers and creeks out in California and other western states contain a lot of minerals from the mountain snow that run off during the spring. So I guess this means the trees that grow near these bodies of water have a higher chance to contain that wild figure and color. Uh, like I said, I have no clue this is, if this is actually true or not, so if someone knows the real answer or if they can fact check me and make sure this is right, I would love to know down in the comments, so just let me know. Anyways, with that being said though, where I live, we only have these little baby Appalachian Mountains that pale in comparison to the big Rocky Mountains out west, but... That being said, that means we have an abundance of walnut and oak and other hardwoods, so it's really easy to get your hands on some nice straight grain lumber. It's hard to drive more than like 10 or 20 miles without seeing a sawmill somewhere out here. So while we don't typically have those 60 inch wide like Bastone or Clara walnut slabs, it is nice to have access to regular old straight grain wood at a pretty cheap price since it's really common out here. But you know how the saying goes, the grass is always greener on the other side. So this slab is actually pretty clean, meaning there isn't really many little cracks and checks in it. And it's a really solid piece of wood with basically no rot at all, which is a good thing and what you want when you're working with a piece of wood like this. However, there is this pretty huge pit in the center of the table that obviously needs addressed. And you just saw me clean up all the dirt and grit from out of the center, but now I'm preparing to fill that with epoxy. There was also this little crack on the side that I thought maybe I could cut out and just patch it up with a matching piece of wood so it would kind of just disappear. But I decided to go ahead and fill that section too and I had to make that little makeshift form to try to fit around that curved section with that little piece of thin plywood and it actually held up pretty nicely. So something that I've been thinking about a lot is why I actually enjoy woodworking and creating with my hands. And the truth is, I still can't actually fully figure it out. I think my favorite thing about what I do is honestly just designing the furniture and it really has nothing to do with even building it. I figured this out recently because when I can't sleep at night and I'm rolling around trying to go to bed, it's because I have 13 different designs in my head for one table I wanna build and I have no clue how I'm going to pick the next one. And it's not because I can't wait to go glue up an oak panel the next day and sand it for two hours. <laughs> I enjoy trying to push the boundaries of what I can design. And then I guess I just feel obligated that I have to create it in real life, if that makes any sense. I can't say there's really one point of the construction process of a piece of furniture that I actually really enjoy and I'm like more excited about than others other than when it's done because I don't have to stress about it anymore. I truly think that if you want to build furniture for a living, your design skills are just as important as your craftsmanship. I mean, literally anyone can cut a slab of wood in half and pour some blue goo down the center of it and call it a day. But I think where you can really stand out is spending hours designing a piece of furniture where each component of the piece is actually meaningful. Okay, listen, I'm trying to sound way smarter than I actually am, so I'm just gonna relax. I'm not even that good at design yet, so I don't have much room to talk. In fact, I've not even had any formal training at all. I just get my inspiration from websites that sell expensive furniture because they probably know what they're doing and I don't. So for the smaller cracks on a table like this, I started using this thicker epoxy that cures in only a couple hours rather than a couple, well, I guess a day, like normal tabletop epoxy. So not only can you just shove it into the cracks, but you can sand it down in a few hours and then continue to work on the piece, which is a game changer and allows for more efficiency because come on, who doesn't love to be efficient? Anyways, there were a few spots on the slab that could use some bow tie inlays because of the risk of them expanding in the future. How big is that risk? I don't know, maybe like a 1% chance that they'll actually continue to span and break through the epoxy. But I am shipping this table to Texas and it's a completely different climate 
compared to PA. Also, quick side note. Do you know that people from Pennsylvania are like the only people to refer to their state as their abbreviation? Like in this case, the letters PA. I don't know why I mentioned that, but I think it's just kind of weird. But <laughs> anyways, I'm shipping this table to a different climate that's 2,000 miles away. I don't want to risk the slab expanding, so I don't mind taking an extra hour or two to add some bow ties. So I did mention earlier that there is not really one part of the woodworking process I really look forward to other than just the project being done. But I guess that may have been a little bit of a lie because I do actually enjoy inlaying bow ties because it's just so relaxing and satisfying. So any chance I get to do that, I'm going to happily take that opportunity. I did forget to mention that these will actually be on the underside of the table so they will not take away or distract from any of the cool figure on the top. Some people really like the look of bow ties and some people hate them. And I think the reason that some people really don't like them is because, well, I'm just going to say it, most people just don't do them right. And I mostly see big fat bow ties that are just routered in with big rounded edges that just kind of look ugly. But I think if you do these slim, thinner, hand cut bow ties with the sharp edges, they can look sleek, modern, and like actually attractive. So see folks, it's all about the little details. So once I got my bow tie set and cleaned up, I could check to make sure I'm still the self-proclaimed bow tie goat and check to make sure I had a tight fit. Now there were only a couple of minor things left to do on the top, like just fill a little bit of cracks with some CA glue and sand that down. But after that, there was pretty much nothing left to do. So I could go ahead and set it aside and start working on the base. For the base, I'm going to be using this big slab of red oak to make up both the legs. My legs need to be roughly three and a half inches thick, so I'll need to make two thinner two inch panels and laminate them together. You'll see what I mean, just, just watch a video, you know? If you've watched my videos for a little bit now, you may have noticed that I use red oak in almost all my builds, and it's really for two main reasons. The first being, I have a ton of this stuff. About four years ago now, my dad and I mowed up like eight or nine red oak trees on our property. And now I have an absolute stockpile of lumber just begging to be used. The thing about red oak though is for most modern furniture these days, it doesn't really have the most appealing natural color when you compare it to its buddy white oak. Red oak has a naturally pinkish hue, which is not really what you want. Wow, white oak has a beautiful grayish kind of tan hue, which when you put some finish on it, it really looks beautiful. White oak and red oak are like those two friends where the one is just better than the other in about every single way possible. Like the looks of it, the strength, and even like the skin tone. And the ugly one is kind of like low-key jealous about it a little bit. Long story short is I have a lot of red oak and I want to use it. The second reason why I use it a lot is because it does really have a beautiful grain structure that allows it to be like prominently noticed. This is why I almost always dye it black or even sometimes white now because you can change the color of the wood but when you look real closely you can still see that grain that just gives that little bit of extra detail. Once I have my thick tree trunk legs glued together I had to figure out how to cut that oval out in the center of the legs. Now I had to do this step now because I still have a square reference surface at this point and once I do that rounding over of the legs it'll be pretty much impossible to get that perfect oval shape. So I got this little oval jig from Rockler that actually really came in handy and did a pretty good job at getting the shape that I want. Basically like a circle jig but just cooler if that makes any sense. Instead of just one axis, it has two axis points to do a little spinny thing, and then it just makes an oval. I mean, that's the best explanation you're getting from me, because what, do I look like Pythagorean or something? Since I didn't have a straight bit that was three and a half inches long, I had to figure out a way to cut out the rest of the oval, 
I thought of many ways I could do this, but this is really the best way I could think of. So it probably makes no sense at all what I'm doing right now, but allow me to explain. So I'm taking a Forstner bit and clearing out the entire perimeter of the oval. This will hog out a lot of that material I don't want, but it will also allow me to get a template bit down there with a router to copy that oval shape the whole way down through the thick piece of wood. Now I'm almost sure there's a better way to do this, but guess what? This is the way that I'm doing it, and that's what makes woodworking so great. There are oftentimes a ton of different ways to get the same result, and some are usually more right than others, but figuring out the order of operations you need to take in order to shape a piece of wood the way you want it to be can be actually kind of enjoyable. So I guess there is another thing about woodworking that I like in the most simple terms possible is just figuring out the best way to turn a piece of wood into a different shape. I had to upgrade to a little bigger template bit in order to route down into the wood as deep as I possibly could. Taking off the wax there is always so satisfying and I love when I get to do that. But I got my chunky router out and started to going to town. You can see my choice of safety glasses here is kind of an interesting pick. They were the first thing I saw laying on the table and I figured if I'm going to be safe I might as well look cool doing it. So after I was done routing though I got a little sidetracked after my drill died and I just figured I want to see how fast I could reload a drill battery. So after I'm done spending my limited time learning a new valuable skill, I can cut out the back side with my jigsaw. Uh, yeah, last time I checked, jigsaw blades aren't supposed to look like that, but it happens. I used to be a pretty big jigsaw hater and would avoid trying to use my jigsaw at all costs. But once I was forced to go buy some new blades because all my old ones kept breaking, I ended up buying some rough cut blades and that made all the difference in the world. Not only did it cut like butter, but it cut much straighter too. So I have to go ahead and apologize to all my jigsaws out there for all the unjustified hate I've been dishing out. My flush trim bit was just long enough to take care of the rest of the routing and I finally had my ovals done after this. This part took a good few hours to do and something I really need to start working on is estimating how long a process is going to take. I figured when I started doing this, all I have to do is just come out here, cut some ovals and I'll be on my way to the next process. I mean like that should only take like an hour tops. And I do this for probably every part I need to make. What was only supposed to be an hour of work turned into two or three because I severely underestimated the time I need. Like, you should see my to-do list. I plow like 10 different tasks on that thing, and I dang well know it's going to take longer than an hour to do each of those tasks, and I somehow expect to get all that work done in a day. Then I sit back after the day is over and see like three or four tasks checked off the list, and I'm like, wow. I guess I'm just the world's most unproductive human. In reality though, I just need to reset my expectations and know that good things just take a long time. Speaking of something that's probably going to take a long time, I began the process of making another oval, this time just on the top. I'm using a template I made using a laser engraver to allow me to get that ovular shit. Ovular, ovular, that's such a weird word, but you know what I mean, the, the oval shaped profile. I use the template to get the oval shaped profile. Anyways, <laughs> I could have just as easily left these legs in a block shape and just called it a day. And I mean, that would have saved me an entire day's worth of work. And I did say I want to become a good furniture designer. And good furniture designers do the extra work and don't compromise just because something's going to take a while to do. So this is me not compromising, I guess. I mean, I don't know. It's probably really not that deep. But 
Anyways, I made a couple of passes on the table saw to remove the majority of the extra material that I don't need. And then I'll take this electric hand planer and work my way up to the oval shape. As close as I can get at least without shaving too much wood off because you know the old saying, you can always take more off but you can't put more back on. Once I got it shaped very close, I got my small block plane out so I could actually feel like a real woodworker for once. Speaking of that, I gotta give props to the craftsmen who still only use hand tools cause dang they do be slow. Gotta give a shout out to my man Benjamin Franklin for inventing electricity. He's the real OG for that one. Alright, uh, yeah, I probably should out of stop with the Gen Z slang because there are very few people who actually are my age and watch my videos. So if you're between the age of like 18 and 24, let me know down in the comments. So I want to see my fellas representing. Anyways, uh, a rotary phone, record player, and like a Walkman. There, there's some slang that should help me fit into the people that actually watch my videos. Also, back in my day, I had to walk uphill five miles both ways to school. Once my legs are shaped and sanded, I can go ahead and dye them black. Now, I can already see the comments saying, that black paint ruined the legs. First of all, it's not paint, it's dye. And second of all, it actually looks really good in person. It may be harder to see on camera, but the black dye on red oak actually looks amazing. Also, it matches the walnut tabletop much better than it would if the red oak was not stained. Now it's time to add that gold ring around the inner part of the leg. I'm brushing on some gilding adhesive for the gold leaf to adhere to the wood. I originally was planning to use brass leaf for the inner part, but apparently brass leaf doesn't even exist. So I went with the next best option, which is 24 karat real gold leaf, which I mean, honestly, in my opinion is way cooler anyway, so I don't really have to worry about that. After I applied the adhesive, you're supposed to give it about a half an hour to dry and then you can go ahead and start applying the leaf. I was a bit nervous to do this because I've never done this before and that gold leaf was pretty expensive so I really wasn't about to mess it up but I just sent it and started slapping the gold on. It's honestly a really simple process. You just lay the gold leaf on there and use a little brush to make sure it's fully adhered to the wood. Then you can take off that backing paper and you just repeat the process until you have every little bit covered up. Now I had to go back with a few extra pieces to make sure I got every little crack in there because it was kind of hard to get it all in one go. But luckily it overlaps and lays flat so you can't really tell or see any seams on it as well. There were a couple spots where the gold got onto the outer part of the leg and I just used a soft pad with some sandpaper to sand away that extra gold and I could come back with some of that black dye to fill that area back in and I promise you once the black dye dried you could literally never tell the difference. So I'm not going to lie when I started doing this I was pretty nervous and the first couple sheets I put on it looked pretty awful. I was like I just ruined this whole thing but I kept layering on a bunch of sheets and I actually ended up using the whole pack of this which there was like 25 sheets in there so to do the other leg I'll have to order another pack which kind of stinks because I'll have to wait a couple days for that to come in but anyways it really looks great and I'm really happy with it so let's go. So the next thing I have to do is figure out how I want to attach these legs to the top. And I decided to go with the simplest way I could possibly think of. And I just got these two plates of aluminum that are six by 12 inches off of eBay that I plan to use. I usually use steel plates, but I saw these aluminum plates that were six by 12, which is a size that I needed on eBay. And I just ordered them and I wanted to see if it really made any difference. I figured it would be a little bit easier to machine the slots for the table since the aluminum is a bit softer than the steel and I still think these will honestly be plenty strong enough and I should have no issues. You may notice I didn't add any slots to allow for wood movement and that's because these holes are only drilled across like a 12 inch span, like maybe even a 10 inch span. Now Jonathan Katzmosis actually has this pretty cool wood movement calculator and it says that the slab will move 5 128ths of an inch 
which is basically nothing at all. This means I can screw the bolts in tight, maybe even if I want to just back them off like a quarter turn, and they will be more than fine. Once I have the legs figured out, I can start preparing the top for finishing. I thought about this for a while, and I decided to just go with an eighth inch round over on both the top and the bottom of the slab. Now, I did think it would maybe look pretty cool if I did a huge like one inch or even inch and a half round over on the bottom, and then did that same small round over on the top, but I was afraid that it might make it just a little too busy, a little too much going on, so sometimes less is more, and I decided to just, just keep it simple for this one. Then I can align the legs where I want them to go, and I took some time spacing them out, backing up, and making sure the proportions were right, and they were evenly spaced out where I want them. And if you notice there, you can see the one leg didn't have any gold on it yet. And that's because, like I said earlier, I'm waiting for that gold to come in. And I figured while I'm waiting for it to come in, I might as well keep working. It wouldn't really make sense to stop and wait for that. So don't worry, I'll get the gold on that one. But here I'm routing out two channels to allow for those aluminum plates to sit flush with the bottom of the table. And this is just really something I think you need to do and it will bump the quality of your product up a little bit more. No, it's not really necessary, but you probably just ought to do it, you know? At this point, we're getting very close to the end, but I honestly still had a good amount of work to do. Once I added the threaded inserts, I could attach the legs and make sure they were stable and they just fit right. There were also a bunch of pinholes on the top that I had to fill with some CA glue. And I really took my time sanding here to make sure I got a perfect finish in the end. You would spend all this time building a table and it would be a shame just to not take your time to sand it the right way instead of ruining the final product. I'm using a light that will shine across the table to highlight any swirl marks I may have missed with the sander. And once I'm happy, I went with the tried and true finish of Rubio Monocode. For this piece of wood, I figured it would be the best finish as it would really make that figure look almost three dimensional. And I can't really argue with the fact that it's super easy to apply. So that's what I went with. So now that you're starting to see the final table come together, I'm honestly super curious. I know how different this table is and it's not something that you would really see anywhere. Obviously, I love the look of the table because I built it and I have a little bit of bias, but everyone that I showed a picture of the table to really liked it, but I feel like that's not really a fair assessment since they were probably still too afraid to tell me if they didn't actually like it. So there's one place I can go and get the absolute truth and people's honest opinions, and that's the YouTube comment section. So wait until you see the final shots, but be honest, do you like this table? Do you hate it? Was the bean shaped top the dumbest idea you've ever seen or is it actually pretty appealing? The good thing is in the nicest way possible, I don't actually care what you think because I like it and my client likes it. So at the end of the day, it's really a win-win. So for the final touches, I finished the legs with some water-based polyurethane which will seal that gold leaf into place. And I also just spray painted those aluminum plates black so they match a little bit better. So remember at the beginning of the video when I said there was some drama to the end of this? Well, I shipped this table down to Texas and I'm not gonna lie, I built a pretty mean crate. I spent a lot of time making sure there'll be no way this crate should sustain any damage at all. But obviously UPS wanted to put that to the test because the crate arrived to the customer absolutely destroyed. I wish I had some pictures to show, but I don't, and he basically said the crate was just in shambles. And I was so stressed out and upset when I got this news, but luckily, somehow, the table was completely unharmed. Call it luck, or just call it a buttload of bubble wrap, so I guess think twice before you ship with UPS again. Anyways, I was super happy with how this table turned out. I really love the gold and the walnut color together mixed with the black legs. So like I said earlier, let me know. Do you love it? Do you hate it? I would love to know your opinion. Thanks again for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe because I have some more cool builds on the way. So I will see you in the next one.